You're listening to Counselors on the Couch, an open conversation between counselors, coaches, and specialists discussing how people just like you can solve a multitude of challenges. Counselors on the Couch is hosted by Dr. Chuck Carrington. We invite you now to join us on the couch to listen in as Dr. Chuck and his specialist guests and experts candidly share insider information on how they help solve the problems that drive people into counseling. So welcome back, James and Kathy. Today we're talking about the concept of being responsible to, not responsible for other people. And this extends beyond spouses, ex-spouses. It's everybody in our lives. This is kind of a mantra, but in divorce, it's just crucial to understand this is a belief. I am responsible to you. And that's about my behaviors, my actions, my reactions. But I'm not responsible for you, which means I can't take somebody else on as a burden that we're all responsible for ourselves. That's the gist of it, but I think we can talk about it deeply. So we're going to do this open forum. So I'm curious which one of you would like to maybe dive in and give this a shot first. Okay, responsible for, responsible to is probably one of the most valuable lessons that any of us can learn in life. And particularly when we're going through a breakup of a marriage, a breakup of a relationship, a divorce, it's essential for the healing process. And many people aren't even aware of the difference in those things. So that's something that can help you move ahead and help you heal. And it can be so freeing. Okay. That's a good summation. Dr. James. This is a big topic, actually. And it's an area that really should have been discussed before you got married. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Unfortunately, this whole thing of boundaries is probably a big reason why people ended up getting divorced to begin with. Because of the failure to recognize boundaries, the failure to respect each other's boundaries, the selfishness that comes along with all of this, you know, and you just end up with camp run amok, you know, because you don't know where you end and where the other person begins. Mm -hmm. I think the best example of the concept of being responsible to someone versus responsible for someone is what they tell you when you're flying on an airplane and that when the oxygen mask drops, put your oxygen mask on first. Okay, and then you can help whoever you're sitting beside put theirs on because you can't do them any good if you die because of asphyxiation. That's kind of what this is about. It's and we'll get more into this, I'm sure, as the time goes on. But you got to take care of yourself and you can be helpful to other people. You can assist other people, but you can't do it for them. Okay, you can't quit using drugs for the other person. You can't. Quit being an alcoholic for the other person. You can't exercise for the other person. You can't deal with the other person's traumas and grief and pain. At the end of the day, every person's got to deal with their own issues. And while you can create an environment that helps facilitate that and helps be supportive of that, the reality of it is, is that you can't do it for them. I think that's a huge concept. And I see this every day in marriage counseling. People come in and their marriage is a disaster. And honestly, probably about 50% of the people that walk in the door, the marriage is already dead. And one partner is trying to drag the marriage behind them like a dead corpse. The other one is already psychologically out the door. And what happens is the partner who's still invested decides they're going to try to force a resolution. They're going to try to force change. They're going to try to almost coerce the other person into becoming somebody or something they don't want to be. Because they feel responsible for that person's success in the marriage. They don't understand where they end. They try to take responsibility. So that's a that's a good way of looking at it is the boundary. That's why we have this following boundaries is because if you don't understand boundaries, then you can't possibly understand. Mm -hmm. We are only responsible for ourselves. So that's a good that's another good point. Kathy, before we started, you were you had a lot of good points. I'm wondering if can we talk about the concept of responsible to versus for in regards to manipulation? Because you brought that up in our conversation. Yeah, there's this is such a rich topic. There's so much to it. But how many of us are even aware that when we are having that sense of being responsible for somebody, we're trying to take care of somebody, we're trying to make everything right for them, that we're opening the door to that person if they are so inclined 
to manipulate us, to use that for their purposes. You make yourself very vulnerable. And so that's where it ties into boundaries, too, is because it's not safe for you to be responsible for other people. You leave yourself open to that other person manipulating you. And they can put blame on you when they fail. Exactly. Exactly. If you hadn't done this, I wouldn't have done that. I mean, how many that's that's a very common in relationships, especially if there's uh, emotional abuse or or verbal abuse in there. That's a very common thing that you will hear. And so it's one of those things you just wish that people could grasp that concept. And I have to be honest and say, I wish I had grasped (laughs) that concept way earlier in my life. You're talking about. Blame shift, which you see in addicts, Mm -hmm. you see in people who have low emotional awareness, you see in people who are highly manipulative, narcissists. Blame shifting is a very popular tool that says, if not for you, then, or Mm -hmm. it's not my fault because it's the lack of taking personal responsibility. We see a lot of that in relationships, not just divorce. Mm -hmm. I think that blame shifting is a good sign of somebody who recognizes that your boundary is weak enough that they can transgress it and make you responsible for their behavior. Well, yeah. And and you see that a lot in marriages that are failing. So here's an example. You know, one of the people in the marriage goes out and has an affair. And instead of taking ownership for what they did, admitting their failure and their wrong in it, well, if you were a better wife or a better husband, I wouldn't have had to go outside the marriage. That's blame shifting. Mm-hmm. The reality of it is, is that they're not taking responsibility for themselves. And when the other spouse tries to buy into that concept, it just creates huge dysfunctionality. And it really sets up a situation for abuse. Mm-hmm. It sets up a situation for a stunted growth of the other party. But it's scary, right? You, you've been in this marriage for 20, 30 years. You know, the fear of the unknown is a real fear. And, you know, and most people in marriages don't really experience any personal growth. They just suck the life out of each other. And the thought of having to now take responsibility. See, in order for me to make you take responsibility for yourself, I got to take responsibility for myself. And that's a scary thought. Because I got to look in the mirror. And I got to say, where am I screwing up? And what am I doing wrong? And what do I need to change? And then if I start to change all these things, you know, what's that going to do to the system that we're in called marriage? Because I can't change without having an impact on the other person in the relationship. Mm -hmm. And so you get in this loop of, you know, better the devil you know than the one you don't. (laughs) And you just live in this mess of dysfunctionality for years. So you just made a good point. You made a bunch of good points. So here's the one that jumped off the page at me. If we don't understand the boundary of what we are doing, what we're responsible for, then we are prone to allowing other people to cause us in our self-esteem to take wounds that are not legitimately ours. Mm -hmm. My best example would be I, I work with a lot of folks that are struggling because of an infidelity or a betrayal. The betraying spouse, sometimes they'll take responsibility and they'll do their work, but the betrayed spouse almost always seems to take on responsibility for the betrayal themselves. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not young enough. I'm not thin enough. Mm -hmm. I'm not sexy enough. I'm not this. And they almost want to lift the, the guilty side out of the guilt by taking on to themselves because they need to be able to explain it to themselves why this happened. And so they make themselves a victim in their self esteem unknowingly because they don't understand you're not responsible for what this other person did. Mm -hmm. They made a choice to be unfaithful. You can't make somebody be unfaithful. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that I would say in, there's a good number of people who come through divorce care who are there because of a spouse that has been unfaithful, a spouse that has left them for another person. And that is a very common thing that we see when they first start coming is the fact that they are carrying the the weight of that burden themselves. They it was their fault that their spouse did this. And it it takes a while. They think it is. They think it they think it's they believe it's their fault. And that's that's part of I would say. And I've mentioned this earlier 
before a few moments ago, in order to heal, you got to get all that other stuff that's weighing you down off you, that you only take what you own and let the rest go. There was a story about this guy that had this wagon and God told him, I want you to pick up that rock, put that in your wagon and pull it up the hill. And so the guy says, sure. And so he's going down the road and his neighbor sees him and says, where are you going? He goes, I'm taking this rock up to the top of the hill because God told me to. And the guy says, well, hey, I have this that has to go up to the top of the hill. Can you take that? Sure. So the guy puts it in and then he comes to another person and that person adds in something to and so on and so forth that, you know, this guy's pulling this thing and he's getting up. Then he finally gets to the top of the hill and he says, glad I didn't know this was going to be so long. Hard for me to do. He goes, I only gave you one rock. You chose to put the other things in there. So that that's a story that kind of, you know, that always stuck with me with it because it's a very visual thing. It's kind of like we are not required to carry another person's failures. We are not required to carry another person's decisions. And as you were saying, but sometimes it's almost easier for us to take that blame because at that moment in time, it gives us a reason for something we just can't possibly understand. It's easier for us to take the blame than to just let it float out there. You know, why did this happen? It's also possible that we accept the blame because we're looking for a reason that we can attend to, that we can make the change right. happen. So we take it upon ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it's not just spouses. So this topic extends to, to the children as well. Uh -huh. If you think about little kids, especially when they find out mom and dad are divorcing, they naturally assume that if they're just a better child or if they will behave differently, mom and dad will get back together. That's just almost a universal thought with small yep. children. Sometimes even adult children have a hard time understanding this is not me that's getting divorced. This is my parents. Yep, it's true. So this you have to teach this to the kids. Well, if you don't understand it yourself, you cannot teach your children. Mm -hmm. The, I thought you had your story. You're going to say the burden got so big that he couldn't get the horse up the hill. <laughs> and you know, so being overburdened because you're taking on other people's burdens. Yeah. It's a limiting factor. It's, mm -hmm. it's certainly not helping anybody. And we're not called to take on other people's burdens and carry them ourselves. We can help them. It's loving to help somebody, but to take it and, and put it at put it as your thing that you have to solve, that you have to fix. You know, it's it's not helping anybody there. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, we're called to love, you know, in the 13th chapter of Corinthians, first Corinthians tells us what that looks like. It's patience, mm -hmm. kind, gentle, meek, long suffering, you know, caring. We're called to stand with people who are hurting, stand with people who are in pain, but we can't heal their pain. You know, we can encourage them. We can facilitate them. We can lead them, but at the end of the day, they're the ones that have to do the work. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, they don't want to do the work because it's hard work. At that point, unfortunately, there's not a lot you can do. Mm -hmm. I mean, the sad thing is, is that you have to have more training to get a driver's license mm -hmm. than you do to get a wedding license. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> You have to go some you know, to get a driver's license. You have to go somewhere. You have to take a test. You have to prove to the state that you can drive the vehicle. Um, you have to parallel park. You know, <laughs> I don't think they do that anymore. Oh. But, you know, but to get a wedding license or a marriage license, you just go to the, and pay the money and that's it. If you had healthy boundaries to begin with, this wouldn't be such a difficult issue. The problem is, is that most of us don't. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that most of us get married because we see in the other person the potential for them to help you heal your own pain from your childhood. Most people marry either their mother or their father. And when they get out of it and they look back, they can say, yep, I married my mom or I married my dad because they're trying to have this other person help them, you know, successfully transition from the trauma that they had when they were children. So. Is it any wonder that half the marriages end up in divorce and probably the other half that aren't divorced, you know, a good 50 to 75 percent of them are dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. So then the question comes down to, OK, I decided I'm going to get healthy. 
well, what impact is that going to have on my dysfunctional marriage? And how is that going to function? Because if the other person wants to get healthy too, okay, great, you're in good shape. But if, you know, if they like things the way they are and you start changing, that's going to create a lot of conflict. True. One of the laws of physics is that anything in motion tends to stay in motion and anything at rest tends to stay at rest without external forces working on it. We get into these relationships and, and we establish a norm and we establish a pattern and we establish their own momentum. And to change that is rather difficult mm-hmm. and it creates a lot of conflict. You know, one of the things that strikes me with this is, is there's so many, I mean, I, I, the word codependent <laughs> keeps jumping in my mind, you know, as we're talking about this, because that's one of the key things with codependency, I think, from what I understand about it, is that that's just it. You're responsible for other people. So I think that that's a word that a lot of people have heard. But it's another one of those words that can easily be misunderstood as far as what exactly that it means. But that's one of the key things in it. You, When you're codependent, you try to fix things for other people. You enable other people. You And that's and if when you're responsible, when you're trying to be responsible for somebody, you're enabling them. You are not allowing them what to do, what they need to do to become healthy themselves. So, like I said, I just see codependency as a honestly, I was raised to be codependent. It's in my genes. My mother God bless her, sweet woman, codependent all the way. And she trained us well. And so it's something that I really, I didn't know was something I was doing. So that's one of the things, also awareness. Oh my gosh, you mean I've been doing this all my life? And then you have to change it. As with being responsible to and being responsible for, the idea is allowing the other person to grow and become who they need to be in order to do that. You need to, it's also, it's not just for you that you are doing, that you are being responsible to, not responsible for, but it's also for that other person because it puts them in that place where they've got to make a decision about what direction they're going to go in. It's very similar to raising kids. If you do everything for your child, they never individuate and then launch into adulthood. Yeah. As you were talking, I was I I try not to do this because I don't want to be unfair, but I was thinking about my marriage as you were talking for the first probably three quarters of my marriage. I was thinking if I do this, if I do that, if I change this, things will get better. Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to be responsible for everything my wife was doing Mm -hmm. and how it related to me. Then at the end, when I got angry, I switched it and I made everything her fault and none Uh of it mine. So both extremes were wrong. Because I just stopped trying and I didn't look at what am I really doing or not doing. And if I had not done some of the things that I was doing, thinking I was helping, she would have thought earlier on, I have to do this. Mm -hmm. I think she did the same thing back to me. I think Mm -hmm. she tried to help me Mm -hmm. instead of help her. I tried to help her instead of me. In the end, neither one of us had any patience to help each other or ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I learned most of my lessons about marriage Mm -hmm. post-divorce. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think I think all three of us did. <laughs> <laughs> That's the yeah, idea, yeah, yeah, because it's the postscript of going back and doing an autopsy on what happened is where you get most of the learning from. Well, it's also being a parent too. You know, you sit there and you look back on all the things that happened with your kids, you know, the things that you did with your kids and how you failed them and such like that. But one of the things My kids will tell you I never failed them on anything. Nothing you're the perfect parent. Anyways, um, there are those out there. See, the the problem with this is that, okay, fine. Why do you do that? Well, I think the primary driver of all of this is fear. Mm. So here's a great example. You know, your husband or your wife is an alcoholic. You know, they've tied one on. They're too drunk to call in for work. So the spouse calls in, you know, Mm -hmm. Joe can't make it in today. He's sick. Yeah, he's really, really sick. Well, he's just drunk in the bed. But, you know, if Joe doesn't go to work or doesn't show up without some sort of a legitimate excuse, Joe's going to lose his job. And if Joe loses his job, there's not going to be more, any more money in the house. And how am I going to pay the bills and how am I going to mm-hmm. you know, feed the kids and how am I going to, you know, where's the money going to come from? The reality of it is, though, is that 
by covering for somebody, they see no need to ever try to get better. And even if you don't, and, and I don't want this to sound like a panacea, even if you say, I'm not covering for you anymore, they still may not take the responsibility that they're supposed to take. Okay. But at some point, you just can't do it anymore. The concept of fear, I think that that's a good place. We, we, we should take that rabbit trail for a moment. The concept of fear in the marriage explains why people keep trying harder and harder to take responsibility for the other person because they're afraid if they don't, they will get hurt. And so one of the things we talk about in um, counselor education is if you're working harder than your client, you're doing something wrong because the client has to do the work. Mm -hmm. Only thing we do is we set up the boundaries in a marriage. If you're working hard to resolve everything and your and your partner is not, you're doing something wrong because they have to take responsibility. But it's the fear of the marriage failing or the fear of being hurt that causes us to overcompensate or overwork and that enables Mm -hmm. the other person. Mm -hmm. So you just perpetuate the problem. So you both have, I think, the opposite sides of the same coin here. You're talking about codependency. You're talking about fear-based. And I think they both go together. Mm -hmm. If you're too fearful, you create codependence. Mm -hmm. Knowing that you're working too hard is your first clue. It's a hint. What's going wrong? If I'm working this hard and it's not getting better, what's wrong? What's wrong is you're being responsible for that other person. Mm -hmm. Well, somebody described to me one time that the fear, the type of fear that makes people do irrational things, because I think a lot of times, you know, if someone, the person that you're talking to who's in the midst of all of this, if they just heard this about a third person that they didn't know, you know, she's, you know, she's tolerating his drug use and she's tolerating his, his physical abuse, you know, and it would be like, Why is she staying there? I mean, how can she be so stupid as to stay there? But somebody told me one time that these type of irrational behaviors, they all come down to the fear of death. And let me explain what I mean by Hmm. that. If he leaves, then I won't have anywhere to live and I'll have to live on the street and I'll have no food to eat. And it's going to come into wintertime and I will die. Now, you don't rationally think through it that way. But the feeling is, I will die. I can't live without this person. You know, the devil I know is better than the devil I don't know. Mm -hmm. Because if this situation changes, I don't have enough healthy love of self or enough confidence to believe that I can make it without this person. And so without this person, I will die. So Mm -hmm. your survival instinct is kicking in. It's exactly what it is. It goes right back to the hind portion of the brain. It's survival. It's fight or flight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, and we talked about this before that, you know, the emotions are in the middle portion of the brain and they either get moved to the front part, which is the cognitive portion, or they get moved to the back part, which is the more primitive side. And so when you're hearing this, these types of behaviors from a third person, then it's very easy for you to be cognitive. Mm -hmm. But when you're in it yourself, you're in the back part of your brain and it's survival instinct. And when you're there, you don't even realize that that's where you're thinking from. That's true. You know, you don't even realize I'm thinking from this place. That was one of the most valuable things that I learned along the way and also was able to use it with my daughter. I would just say to her when something was going on, okay, stop for just a minute. Tell me what part of the brain are you operating from? And, and just say, that may sound strange to tell, say that to a teenager. But, <laughs> but the, the, the idea was, was the fact that in that split second, that if she heard think, it was able just to take that shift. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Just to pull it out of there. It's awareness. She, it's awareness. And it's the same thing. That, that's awareness is so important in um, being responsible to and responsible for, with codependency, with everything else, with with our relationships, is being aware, being able sometimes, honestly, to just kind of, if something's going on, to be able to step back for just that moment and detach for just a moment to see what is actually going on so that you can <laughs> come back to that front part of your brain. But because we don't, we don't, as human beings, half the time, we don't know why we do what we do. We tend to be on autopilot. We do. Well, and that's part of our survival instinct as well, mm-hmm. because you can't stand there and think, there's a lion. He may eat me. Should I run? Should I fight? No, it's just part of the primitive mm-hmm. survival instincts mm-hmm. that 
that we're born with. Mm -hmm. So your husband's or wife says to you, I don't like you anymore. I'm 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 leaving, you know. And so your initial response to that is, is not to think about everything else that's going on, but just to those particular words in that moment in time. And chances are at that moment in time, you're going to do everything you possibly can because of, out of panic to not have that happen. What don't you like about me? I can change. Yeah. We have a tool I use when I'm working with couples. It's the awareness cycle. Mm -hmm. And it challenges the speaker to do exactly what you said, uh, Kathy. It's where is this coming from? We start off with, is this an emotion? Mm -hmm. Is this a thought? Or is this data? Most people huh. assume they're either coming at it from real data or they're coming at it from cognition. But most of the time, they're actually coming at it from an emotion and they try to wrap their cognition around it. And then they look for confirming data after the right. fact. So we get them to tell us what is actually the foundation is actually yeah. going on here. I said that badly. We challenge them first to tell us the foundation of their thoughts or their mm -hmm. comments. And then from there, we ask them, what is it that you want? Mm -hmm. Do you want something for you? Mm -hmm. Do you want something for them? Or do you want something for the relationship? Mm -hmm. And our third level is, are you trying to correct the past? Are you trying to impact the present? Or are you trying to change the future? Mm -hmm. By doing this awareness cycle, you're able to bring the person from either the front of the brain to the back of the brain or the back of the brain to the front of the brain, depending on where they're at, mm -hmm. and then bringing some awareness to the mm -hmm. receiver as to what's actually being asked. Mm -hmm. We don't do this naturally. It happens below the surface and we tend to go to habit. Part of our, our survival is what's worked before will work again. Mm -hmm. But you know, one thing that's, that's cool is as you become more aware of what you're doing, if you're coming aware of, okay, I'm, I, oops, I'm being responsible for at this moment, not being responsible to, and you actually have to exercise that. You have to practice that. You have, in addition to becoming aware of something like that, you have to keep practicing it and practicing it so that it becomes a nat becomes more of a natural pattern so that you do have, you can actually, in, at least this is my own personal experience, have, have that knee jerk reaction first of, oops, wait a minute, versus diving into something. Learning to role play and practice makes it natural. Mm -hmm. And it rolls out of your mouth when it needs to. Mm -hmm. The brain doesn't know that it's between practice and reality. Mm -hmm. It will do what you practice. Mm -hmm. James told me the other day he plays the piano, something I've never been oh. able to master. I can't even minor it. I used um, to play the accordion, too. Okay. <laughs> I, I could talk about that, but we won't. Um, <laughs> but I was thinking about the piano. You can't play the piano if you don't practice it. Right. Until, so my son, who's sitting over there in the corner, he plays the piano. And I watch him play, and he makes it look easy. Well, he's practiced for, I don't know how many years. When I do it, it's mechanical. I have to think about it. Mm -hmm. We don't have time to think about the mechanics of things. We have to practice it until it becomes mm -hmm. natural. Mm -hmm. And then it flows like music. Understanding your responsibility for yourself. It's taking ownership mm -hmm. of yourself. So in a, let's say in a divorce settlement, the lawyers have gotten together and they hammered out this agreement. And the two of you, neither one's going to be happy because no one ever is. But you come to an agreement and then you get to court and then your spouse comes back and says, well, I don't have enough money to live on. And they want to revisit the agreement. Whose problem is that at that point? It's the other person's problem, hmm. but they want you to fix it. And a lot of us. Well, particularly if the agreement is executed, if it's right. been signed, you agreed to that. It's not my issue. But you'd be surprised how many people continue this fight into perpetuity about you don't give me enough alimony or there's not enough child support. Or, you know, you got more in the settlement than me, but the, the reality is you agree to it. And it's no longer the marriage is problem because the marriage has been terminated. Mm -hmm. You have to be responsible to live within the means that you've agreed to, period. Well, you know, all of this stuff, it, it, you know, the more I learn about this stuff, the more I realize that all of these issues come into play when we go outside of the way that God designed for us to be. Because God is responsible to us. He's not responsible for us. You know, I, I think about there's a passage in the Old Testament, I believe it's first Joshua, where God goes to the children of Israel and he says, Look, today I put before you blessings and cursings, life and death. 
And this is my paraphrase. And if you can't figure out which one to pick, choose life. Okay. Mm -hmm. But he didn't choose life for them. Mm -hmm. He made it an option. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus did the same thing. You know, if there were people who needed healing, if they believed, he healed them. If he didn't believe, and it says, you know, he went to some towns and he wasn't able to do very many miracles because they didn't believe. And then you had people who's like, you know, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. He was looking for some level of effort on their part. Mm -hmm. Help my unbelief is taking responsibility for yourself. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So this doesn't mean or nor does this give you a license to be rude. It doesn't give you a license to be cold. It doesn't give you a license to be inconsiderate. You're supposed to come along beside someone and help them work on their own identified issues. But you can't do it for mm -hmm. you. And, and what you see a lot of times in a lot of marriages is that the fear, that fear of abandonment and that fear of rejection will then turn you into a control feed where you're now trying to control everything and everybody because you're afraid that the whole thing's going to fall apart and you've got to work double and triple time to kind of hold it together with chewing gum and bell and wire. And, and then when it falls apart, then what do you do? Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, we create these messages ourselves. Unfortunately, if we'd have known a lot of this stuff before we got married, we might not have married the person that we married to begin with. True. One of the mistakes that people make is they get into this habit of feeling like if I don't do this, that they're demanding of me, then I'm going to feel responsible that the marriage failed or, the, or I'm not a good person. They, mm -hmm. they take it on themselves. That's the apologizing. People mm -hmm. apologize and it empowers the other person and then transgress the boundary. Sometimes we don't want to apologize. There's a guy, I don't remember his name. He's uh, on YouTube and I've sent it to a lot of my clients. He talks about the broken record method of speaking to somebody. He says, I need to take next week off because I have something important to do. And the human resource person says, but you know, you had a week off last month. That may be true, but I need to take next week off. seems like you take an awful lot of time off. That may be true, but I need to take next, take next week off. And you keep repeating it. That's a boundary. When you're responsible for yourself and only to the other person, you say, that might be true what you want, but that's not my problem. Who owns the problem is as simple as who can fix this. You cannot fix someone else's emotional content. You cannot fix somebody else's financial burden. You cannot fix somebody else's beliefs or their values mm -hmm. or the patterns in their life. So you don't own that problem because you don't have the power to fix it. So either they own it, you own it, or you share it. Nine times out of 10, somebody else is trying to ask you to share their problem that you don't have any power or authority over. And that's where, you know, once again, boundaries, because that's setting boundaries for yourself, where you say, this is not on my side of the fence. You know, somebody may be constantly trying to put it over the other side of the fence, but you almost have to repeat to yourself, I, that may be true, but this is not on my side of the fence. And honestly, it, sometimes that goes to get, you think, oh, I'm being selfish. See, that's where it gets confusing about being selfless and selfish and all that can, can get so, so confusing with that because they'll, they'll even sometimes tell you, oh, you're being selfish. And that's gaslighting. And then, yeah, you, know, you throw gaslighting into it, boy. And so you do. I mean, I just know from my past experience, I was so confused because there was, as far as what was right, what was wrong what was good about me, what was bad about me or whatever like that. When I, I left my first marriage, I did not know anything. Anything that I knew about myself was gone because I think in that, in that sense, in that marriage, I was trying to be responsible for, not just responsible to. And so you basically have to start and build yourself up again. And a lot of people that go through marriage are like that because it's, it's part of it is, is the fact that we think that that's the way we're supposed to be. We think we're supposed to give up ourselves. Supposed to is a judgmental word. Yeah. But we, but, but we go into it thinking, you know, I've, I've got to give, you know, if you, except those are narcissists won't do that. But if you give up yourself in this, you're not being responsible for yourself. You're not being responsible to yourself when you give yourself up. When you're you, no longer being yourself. You're no longer being, you don't even, and chance, and how many times have we heard, 
I don't know who I am anymore. I lost myself. Mm -hmm. So that's something we hear again and again with broken marriages is the fact that I don't know who I I am. I don't know who, where I've gone. There's nothing left of me because everything was put into that relationship. So what if you decide that you're going to marry somebody who has a dramatically different cultural conditioning than you? It could be anything. It could be religion. It could be politics. Mm -hmm. It could be values. But you make the choice to marry them. And in making that choice, then they come and they put a demand on you to align with them, even though they know that's not your value Mm -hmm. or that's not your culture. They choose you and they want you to change. How do you respond to that? What happens if you say, "Okay, I'm going to do whatever it takes to make this marriage work, which means giving up my core beliefs? Mm -hmm. What happens to you? Marriage is supposed to be an adult activity between two consenting adults. When my daughter got married, you know, I told my daughter, you know, I will walk you down the aisle, but I will not give you away because you are not property. And you have to enter into this marriage as an adult of your own free will. You're giving yourself to him. I'm not giving you to him. I think that. It's funny how, you know, when we're dating someone, the compromises that we make with ourselves, the things that we say, well, this won't be a big deal. You know, it's a quirk. You know, it it won't be a big deal. And over time, all the varnish wears off and all you're left with is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You are who you are and your core beliefs are what they are. And some of them may be socially acceptable. And some of them may not be. And people learn and people grow and people change. Okay. So I don't want to withhold the development process from anybody. But some things about you don't change. You know, some things are fundamental to who you are and they don't change. And if the other spouse is marrying you with the promise that someday that will change. That's just a recipe for failure. That is the reason why so many marriages fail is because people go into it with the idea of they're a diamond in the rough and I can guide them to perfection. And they try to recreate their spouse or their marriage over in their own image. Instead of Mm -hmm. saying, I love you for you. I'm not going to try to change you. If you don't like that person, why are you marrying them? Well, it's the old saying, you know, and I've heard this before and I found it to be true in many cases. A man marries a woman hoping that she'll never change. And a woman marries a man trying to figure out what she's going to change first. (laughs) That's very similar to my dad's philosophy. He used to say something like that all the time. The reality is if you love somebody, you're supposed to love them for who they are, not who you want them to become. But how many times when we a person enters into marriage, how many people know themselves? Good point. You know how you're you're talking about core beliefs. How many people know what their core beliefs are? How many people, you know, the, the, the term that I always heard was authentic self, you know, discovering your authentic self. We're, we're, in your 20s? Virtually none. No, because we're still, we're still, <laughs> we're still in develop. We are still in, de- we're still developing. We still don't know. And so it's, it's not like, you know, how many kids, how many kids in there, how many kids in their 20s know themselves, you know? You, you don't. But if you're raised well and you have explored it all, you should have some values that are concrete. Yes. But but so like you said, I know that, you know, so a lot of times we will we re, initially, you know, as we're growing up, we rebel against those things True. that were that were that we were taught because, you know, we're trying to find our own self. We're, you know, finding ourself is a tough road. And if in a marriage, in the ideal marriage, where both people are loving each other for who they are, not of who they can become or anything, if you truly love that person and you truly want what's best for that person and you're you are going to you can it can be an avenue for growth, you know, because you as you lift each other up. Mm -hmm. Versus it being sometimes it's almost like it's a competition, um, <laughs> you know, survival. I don't know. I'm not done yet. Anyways, I'm, I'm still growing up. So well, you can't all be perfect like me. So that's, you no. know, that's sad. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of changing another person to make them what you want. That's wrong. But to 
be open to changing yourself through exploration. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think changing the other person is a veiled attempt of taking responsibility for someone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. The idea of this podcast is for those who are either in the process of, of a breakup of a marriage or the possibility of a breakup of a marriage. Somebody listening to this at this moment in time, what can they do now? I'm so glad you asked that question. That's a really good setup for me because there's three things that I believe have to take place. And there's a lot of ways to explain them. But the first one is take ownership of yourself. Learn what you are responsible for versus the things you're taking on, like your example of the wagon. Mm -hmm. What burdens are you letting people put on you versus what is your job? Mm -hmm. So being responsible for yourself. The second one I mentioned earlier is don't apologize for things that are not your problem or your fault. You can say, I'm sorry you feel that way. Right. Not I'm sorry that I'm causing you to feel that way Mm -hmm. because you're not responsible for the other person's feelings. You're responsible for what you do. And the third thing is to understand that what you do in the world does affect other people. We impact people whether we want to or not. And so by being aware of that, and understanding we may be causing somebody stress or even harm, whether we intend to or not, but we don't have to take blame for things that we don't do to people. So the fact that, you know, a couple is fighting and they're getting a divorce and the one person just won't drop dead like they've been ordered to, that's not their fault. You can't fix that for the other person. Your, your ability to go on with their life and be happy or maybe find another, another love Mm-hmm. or to be successful, that is not your fault that the other person is suffering because you're succeeding. But I see that a lot. I can't let go of him or her because they'll be happy. They'll find someone new. They'll get to go be with their mistress or whatever. That is not the other person's responsibility. Mm-hmm. So understanding that what we do impacts people, but we're not to blame for the other person's choices in response to us is important. Who owns the problem? Mm-hmm. Do you own the problem? Do I own the problem? Do we share the problem? And the easiest way is to say, do I have the power to really fix this problem? Mm Because if I don't, it's not my problem. So if we're if we're supposed to be the idea of responsible to not responsible for, how can a person learn that? How can a person take that on? I think that only comes from a, a very healthy love of self. You know, and it comes down to the golden rule, you know, do unto others as you'd mm-hmm. have them do unto you. You know, we should do no harm. We should hold no malice. We should hold no unforgiveness. We should wish no harm on anyone else. On the other hand, we should expect those same things from us and from others. You know, we, we have to somehow get to a point that. We're strong enough on our own in order to be able to provide strength to others without necessarily getting into their mess. You know, my grandfather used to have you know, a say, and he's like, and, it, and I think it's, it's very appropriate for this discussion. Um, he's like, son, never wrestle with a pig because you'll both get dirty and the pig likes it. <laughs> and, and when you take responsibility for somebody else's issues, that's what you're doing. Mm-hmm. You know, you're both going to get dirty and the other person likes it because it's going to allow them to continue to be irresponsible. And sometimes we need we I think one thing we do, we we need the permission. We need the permission to focus, to be responsible to others, not for others. We need it's almost like we need somebody to say it's OK. At least some of us do. It's OK. You don't have to take this on. I don't No, you don't. I didn't know that. That may sound strange, but I can I can relate to that. It's like there were a lot of things that I was doing that I was not aware. I don't have to do that. You know, you know, one of my one of my favorite movies was the last movie that John Wayne ever did. It was The Shootist. And in there, he's a gunslinger who's dying of cancer. And actually, when he finished filming the the movie, he did die of cancer. Mm. But he has this quote. And I've always really enjoyed it. And it says, I won't be insulted. I won't be laid a hand upon. I don't do these things to other people. And I require the same of them. And at the end of the day, that's really what we're talking about here. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. know, that's just a, a Western way of saying 
you know, the golden rule. I'm sorry that, I mean, and, and Kathy, you and I see this all the time, mm-hmm. but, you know, you know, people who are coming in to divorce care and they're broken and, you know, they're shattered. And I'm really sorry that they're going through this. And, and I will pull up beside them and I will give them my very best and I will pray for them. I will listen to them. I will coach and mentor them. But at the end of my, at the end of the day, this isn't my issue. That's very true. That's one thing. It's a boundary when you're working in a program, you know, like Divorce Kid, that you really, you have to set that boundary for yourself. You have to recognize that, yes, we are responsible to every person that comes through that door, but we are not responsible for them. And Mm -hmm. I think there are people that get involved in a program like this that, that take that extra, what they think is the extra step and they start feeling responsible for the people. It happens. You know, we, we, I have seen it happen with people, but that probably is one of it's, it's something that if we don't set that for ourselves, because the only way we can be of help to them, true help to them is if we put that oxygen mask on ourselves and we take care of ourselves, so we can take care of them. And we can't take care of them if we're down there Wrestling with them in the mud like a pig, like you were saying yeah, earlier. I like that, you know, wrestle with the pig analogy. Uh, James, you have a uh, a saying that I like. Uh, I guess it's not a saying, it's a principle. It's the if this, then that boundary. Yeah. If you do this, I'm going to do that. So if you take advantage of me, I'm going to put up a boundary and push you back. If you are good to me, I'm going to be good to you. But it's never about transgressing boundaries without permission. It's never about forcing your will upon another person. It's always a mutually beneficial relationship agreement. Mm -hmm. This is the way that God set things up. He told Adam and Eve in the garden, you know, if you eat of this fruit, then you will surely die. So you got all the, you got the entire garden to eat out of. You can eat anything you want. But if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. In fact, he didn't even tell him that if you eat of the tree of life that you would die. It was only the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was the only one that they couldn't eat. And they did it anyway. So, but you got to have enough self-awareness to say, this is where I end and where mm-hmm. you begin. Mm-hmm. And, and hopefully you can do that in a loving environment. And in an environment of mutual self-respect. But in order to do that, you've got to be able to define yourself first. Mm -hmm. What is your role? So if you have children and the child gets to be about five years old, you send them off to school. We send our kids to school for 12 years at least. And our job is to send them to school, to help them, to encourage them, to do their homework with them reinforce their learning, but we are not responsible for their learning. Uh -uh. We're responsible to help facilitate their learning. You don't go earn their grades for them. They go to college. You might have made a decision in your family. I will pay for college, but you're not responsible for their grades. So you can have that if then, then that talk, right? If you don't, if you don't pass your courses, I'm not paying for them. But if you apply yourself and do well, I will pay for them. That's mutually beneficial to both of you. But you don't send your kid to college and have them get F's after F's after F's. And you keep paying tuition because you think you're responsible for them. Mm -hmm. You know, Henry Cloud tells this story of this guy who came to visit him. And he was a very successful businessman. And he said, you know, I'm here to talk to you about my son. Well, where's where's your son? Well, he didn't come because he doesn't think he has any problems. And he's like, well, tell okay, tell me about your son. Well, he's flunked out of three schools. Three universities. Well, how do you flunk out of three universities? Well, because I'm on the board of these universities. And so when he flunked out of the first one, I got him into the second one. And when he flunked out of the second one, I got him into the third one. Where is, where is he at today? Uh, well, he's skiing in Vail. He's like, well, I agree with your son. He doesn't have any problems. You know, you're the one with all the problems. Our job is to help you transfer some of his problems back to the rightful owner. Mm-hmm. Because you've taken all of his problems away. You know, if you don't have if-then statements, and it doesn't have to be a threat. You know, the if-then statement is not about using it as a way to control the other person. It's about using it as a way to control yourself. If you go out and have an affair, then we will be separated. I will not live in a marriage where, mm-hmm. you, where you're having an affair. 
It's keeping your boundaries yeah. and your values intact yeah. so you don't lose yourself. So I'm not telling you that you can't go out and have an affair. I'm just telling you that when you come back, I won't be here because I'm not living this way. You know, if you come home drunk or you're addicted to drugs, I'm not living with you. We, I will support you going to a rehab program. I will visit you in a rehab program. I will go with you to AA or go to you to NA or wherever you want to go. But I'm not going to live with you in this kind of an environment. I'm not. So it, it's about what am I willing to tolerate? Mm-hmm. What am I willing to put up with? Where do I end and do you begin? And it's also responsible to them because you're setting the boundary for their success as well, because you're not enabling them to go to Vail and go skiing. Mm -hmm. They're they're doing what they have to do for their own life. You're not bailing them out. And I think that's a great perspective. We aren't going to rescue people, but we're going to help them succeed. But if they don't want to succeed, we're going to withdraw that help because it's not helping them. Mm -hmm. It's making them codependent. Full circle back to, to Kathy there. Well, I mean, you know, Jesus talks about this as well. You know, he stood on the, either the Temple Mount or the Mount of Olives, and he said, Israel, how many times would I've called you as a hen does her small chicks, but you wouldn't do it. God doesn't force himself on us. Mm-hmm. We shouldn't force ourselves on others. Well, that's the entire Bible. You know, we, he gives us everything we need to be successful, everything that we need to know. And it's up to us to exercise our option. Well, it's up to us to choose life. Mm-hmm. But it's our choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So many people come to counseling. In fact, I get, you know, men don't like to go to counseling to begin with. That's always a tough one. So about 80% or more clients that come to counseling are are women. But a lot of them are married. They come to counseling. I'm having trouble in my marriage. What's your husband think about you being here? Well, he won't come. He doesn't think he needs to be helped. Or sometimes I'll have a couple come in. He's had an affair and she's saying, fix him. Well, the reality is they both have their own issues, but you can't fix a couple when only one person is taking responsibility or only one person is getting the blame or only one person is showing up. It takes two to make a contract. Mm -hmm. It only takes one to break it, but it takes two to make it. And everybody has to know their roles and be in their role. You fix your stuff. Your spouse fixes their stuff or in a divorce, you fix your stuff and your ex fixes their stuff. Mm -hmm. So you can be healthy people. Well, and, and I think you raise a really good point, Chuck. So you have somebody comes in and he had an affair, fix him. Okay, well, what is your responsibility? You're not responsible for the choices that he made of going out and having the affair. Okay? Because he did that on his own. But you are responsible for forgiving him. Mm-hmm. You are responsible for loving him. Mm-hmm. You are responsible for creating an environment where he can be redeemed, not only to you, but redeemed to God as well and restored. Yeah. One of the books that I've read along the way is The Powerful Praying Wife. There's also The Powerful Praying Husband. That Actually, my husband was reading that one. He suggested I read Powerful Praying Wife. Was he, I don't know whether he's being responsible to or for in that case. But, but at any rate, it's the idea is that you are You pray. You don't pray to God. God, please fix him. Please fix her. Please change him. Please change her. No, you pray for God. Lord, change me into the person that I need to be in order to be the helpmate for this person and not a, not a, somebody that perpet. So in other words, in, in any situation, praying for you to change, maybe that change is going to be that, that you step back. Us praying for God to fix somebody else is like telling us, not sort of like telling a counselor, fix them. You know, Mm -hmm. we've got to, we are responsible for ourselves. So Lord, please change me and able, teach me what to do in order to make this the healthiest situation possible or whatever, you know, prayer you want to say in that. One of the hardest lessons I think in a divorce, especially if an infidelity is the problem, because that happens quite frequently is understanding where you're responsible to yourself, even in a circumstance where somebody else chose Mm -hmm. poorly, not to blame anybody because Mm -hmm. I don't want to lay blame. But if you don't look at yourself and say, did I create an environment that encouraged my spouse? Mm -hmm. It's not being responsible for the outcome. It's being responsible for how you contributed to the outcome. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can 
influence your spouse to be positive. You can influence your spouse to be negative. I've seen a lot of people who've had affairs that when they come out of it, they say, well, my ex used to do this, that, and the other thing. And I felt like I couldn't get anything out of the marriage. Therefore, I went outside the marriage. Mm -hmm. Okay. That may be true, but you made a choice. Mm -hmm. However, if the other person wants to remain in the marriage, we need to get them to look at how they contribute to the negative environment Mm -hmm. if they don't want it to happen again. So being responsible for your own content is always the first step. Mm -hmm. Whether you're married or not, whether you're divorced or not, you have to be responsible for your own content. Well, the biggest threat to a marriage is selfishness. When you get right down to the bottom line, it's selfishness. Why we get married sometimes. Mm -hmm. And being responsible for someone many, many times is driven by selfishness. It's, it's, you know, your desire to control someone else, because if you can't control yourself, you're going to look for other people to control, you know, because you want to create an environment where you control everyone else so that it doesn't shine the light on how uncontrolled and out of control you are. You know, it's, you know, being responsible for someone else is, you know, selfishness through self-preservation in some cases, you know, but it all comes down to selfishness. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we've been controlled by other people as well. And so now we want to control others so that we don't get controlled again. And again, that's about being selfish. You're only responsible for you and for a time being, if you bring children into the world, for them. Mm -hmm. But the responsibility to your children becomes less and less as they become capable of doing more and more. Mm -hmm. Some parents have a hard time with that. They continue to want to be responsible for their children regardless. (laughs) And I see children, this failure to thrive Mm -hmm. syndrome that we see so frequently now in our society is parents who have enabled their children by taking away all the responsibility and the children don't have the ability to be responsible for themselves. Right. And that's somebody being responsible for them that shouldn't be for too long. Right. Well, and, and Jesus gave us an example of that in the parable of the prodigal son, you know, where, you know, the son went to his father and said, Hey, I want what's mine. I want it now. Uh, I don't want to wait till you die to get my inheritance. I want it now. And the father gave it to him and he let him go off. And when he had wasted it all and he was starving to death and he was sitting there eating the, the pig slot, he's like, I'll go back home. I'll tell my father I've sinned against him and I've sinned against God. But it, but the, but the interesting part of it is that the scripture says he came to his senses. Mm-hmm. He had a change of heart. Mm-hmm. He had a change of mind. You know, he decided he would do something differently. The father never ran after him. Um, he waited for him to come home. But he let the son feel the full ramifications of the decisions that he had made. You know, part of being responsible to someone is telling them, if you do this, then here are the ways that this is going to work out. Okay. If you go out there and you drive over the speed limit, you're going to get a ticket. And if you get a ticket, it's going to cost you money and your insurance rates are going to go up and you're going to have to get another job to help pay for your insurance, or you're going to have to not have a license. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, you know, it's not putting a governor or a GPS tracking unit on his car and hounding them and saying, you're driving too fast. You're driving irresponsibly. Um, You know, it's, you can do what you want to do, but here are going to be the consequences of your behavior. Mm -hmm. That is probably, you know, uh, and and it applies to, if we only, you know, it's one of the hardest lessons to learn with your kids, you know, to reach that point where you have to say, you know, that, I am responsible to not for you. You've reached that point. I just remember when my t- my son turned 18, I said, okay, now I am, I will always be your mother, but I'm no longer your mommy, you know? And I had, it was good for me to say that because I had to hear myself say that I had to let him go. And I think anybody that's a parent have seen their children make perhaps a few wrong decisions in their growing up years. And, um, and by the grace of God, those children have survived, but, um, but that's an example of, of, you know, of, of letting go. So we, so we know that we have to do this with our children, that we have to let them go like this, but why is it so hard to let our spouses go? 
Why is it so hard, even at the beginning of a marriage, to to set those boundaries and and to focus on being responsible? Do we even do we even know that we're supposed to be doing that? Well, I didn't. I did. <laughs> Most of us go into marriage without any understanding of what we're really going into. And we go into it because we think that person's going to fulfill us. Oh, or yeah. Fix us or somehow fill in this void in our paradigm of the future. Take care of us. Mm-hmm. And those are all rather selfish uh, very limited reasons to get married, but that's why most of us get married. It is. It is. And, and well, you think of that and you also think of a range, think of an arranged marriage, you know, um, fiddler on the roof. Now you think of, you think of an arranged marriage where, where people are put together like that, that, that um, the success of those marriages can actually be higher than the success of, of two people in love getting married. Well, and I think a lot of that is because there's no expectations. Yeah. You know, yeah. the, you know, the people don't really know each other that well. And so, you know, in many cases are picked by the parents mm-hmm. and they, and the parents basically just look for compatibility. Mm-hmm. And there's not been this creation of expectations. Mm-hmm. The cultural expectations are pretty static instead of these whimsical expectations that we have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah I mean, I, you know, I, I, again, I, I mean, we started out this conversation with, uh, you know, how do you differentiate between being responsible to and for someone? And, and, and I think it's really as simple as I will not allow myself to be treated this way. You can do as you choose. You have the freedom to make your own choices. Mm-hmm. Okay. But you need to understand the consequences of those choices. Mm-hmm. Because I will not allow myself to be treated like this. Mm-hmm. So if you want to leave, you can leave. But if you leave, the marriage is over. You know, I will not pursue you. I will not chase you. You can go out and have an affair if you want to have an affair. But you need to understand, you know, and you need to be fully cognizant of what the consequences of the choices that you make are so that when you make that choice, it's not a surprise. But it goes both ways because you also have to treat the other person with boundaries as well. So it's not just, you know, you can't or should not do this. Well, to me, well, and and I it shall should not, be reciprocal. Right. I shall not do these things to you either. Parting thoughts, guys. This has been a good topic. If we only knew then what we know now. Oh, wow. We could do, we could do an hour on that. <laughs> no, that, that, that's the type of thing. I mean, it's like, I guess if, if, if people are listening, give yourself some grace if you didn't know then what you are now beginning to know now. I like that. Yeah. You know, this stuff is never easy. If you're in the middle of all of this stuff now, it, it may seem like it's just overwhelming, but you got to start somewhere. And at the end of the day, your best hope for a healthy marriage is for you to be a healthy person. Mm-hmm. You know, Paul talks about this you know, in the epistles and he talks about, you know, should if, if you're a Christian and you're married to someone who isn't a Christian, you know, should you leave them? And and Paul's like, no, stay with them because unless they choose to leave. But if they don't choose to leave, stay with them because they may see the goodness in you and it may bring them to repentance and it may bring them to get to know Christ. Regardless of where you are in your circumstances right now, focus on becoming the healthiest person that you can be because if they see that you've moved from the person who you are now to a person who is loving, a person who is kind, a person who is full of joy, a person who is giving and caring. And if they knew you before and they know you now, and they've seen you do the hard work, that may be the encouragement they need to do the work for themselves to get to that place as well. Mm-hmm. You know, love is always attractive, but, but, but true love, true love is, you know, is healthy. And it's not this dysfunctional stuff that has been made in the media and through Disney movies. Yeah. You know, I, I was thinking about this from the standpoint, you know, what if I'd have heard this video or heard this podcast, you know, several years ago, I'd be like, I just can't get there from here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you can get here from here. But, but you need in that you need support. This is not a road. I mean, going down this road by yourself 
having support and having encouragement from others is extremely, extremely important in this, especially if we we are looking at the perspective of today's culture, having honest and godly support. Yeah. So, so my parting comments would be, you know, make it your goal to get better rather than to be perfect. Change is a process. Take setbacks in stride and continue going forward. You said a moment ago, it's not easy, but it's very simple. The Mm. problem is simple is not always easy. Mm -mm. But if you have people around you that have gone down the path before or, or who understand or can take that step back and see without using the back of their brain, but they can cognitively see what you're going through, they can help you. It's not complicated. But it's not easy because it takes a lot of effort. It's a big effort to turn the boat. It takes a lot of effort. But the techniques are simple. Yeah, they are. And it reminds, you know, Chuck, when you said that, it reminds me of Michelangelo's David. You know, the the statue of David that he carved out of marble. Mm -hmm. And someone asked him, you know, how did how are you able to carve this beautiful statue out of this marble? He said, oh, it was really easy. David was in the marble to begin with. All I did was take away the stuff that didn't belong there. Mm. That's simple, but it's not easy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's so, simple. so, so, you know, the, the concepts and the process is actually easy. And what you're going to spend most of your time doing is taking away all the stuff that shouldn't have been there to begin with. Yeah. So next week, we're going to be doing the last installment on part two, which has been all about the stress and our reactions to divorce and all these variables. So it's, it's been the heavy lifting part. Next week, we're going to be talking about being separated or newly single and how sex and soul ties come into this and dating and other relationship issues. This one will be fun mm. for all of us young people. <laughs> and then after that we'll be going to part three which is the consequences of divorce and some of the things that have to be thought out so Mm -hmm. it's hard to believe that we're pretty much halfway through the podcast and it feels like we haven't scratched the surface Mm -hmm. but that's okay it's a process it is thanks guys very much we will be resuming next week we're going to talk about sex that'll just be fun counselors on the couch is brought to you by virginia beach christian counseling specialists in family counseling grief trauma and loss find us at www.virginiabeachchristiancounseling.com counselors on the couch is produced and directed by john bell executive producer dr chuck carrington with original music score and mastering by john tyler music The opinions expressed here are of the host and the individual guests and are not necessarily the opinion of Virginia Beach Christian Counseling. If you would like to make a comment or would like to ask to be a guest, please go to counselorsonthecouch.com.